you know things aren't as as active as maybe they will be in a couple of weeks when the big news of the day is a failed top five pick being traded for a fifth round selection from Detroit to Atlanta. But here we are, Jeff Okuda, who never really meshed with the Lions, but who did start 15 games last year, Yeah, but never became the guy he was supposed to be the third overall pick in 20. 20, I believe. I yes, believe 2020, you're right. the you're last right. year of the Bob Quinn, Matt Patricia regime. He's traded the Falcons for a fifth round pick. There he is, the third guy taken after Joe Burrow and Chase Young. And look, it just shows you how random the draft is, where the stars come from, where they don't come from, who works out, who doesn't work out. But Burrow, far and away, the star of that draft class. And yeah. Chase Young was the defensive rookie of the year. But now they're wrestling with whether to pick up his fifth-year option. Okuda's fifth-year option coming up. It would be a stunner of all stunners if the Falcons would pick it up. Yeah. The fact that he went for a fifth-round pick, that that's all they could get for him, tells you that that fifth-year option is not going to be picked up on Jeff Okuda. But now the Falcons have him. And they've got a first-round corner from 2020 in A.J. Terrell who will have the fifth-year option picked up unless they sign him to a long-term contract before then. So now they've got two first-round corners from the same draft, a guy who was taken in the 20s and a guy who was taken third overall. Yeah, you know, Akuda was a little bit like one of those you know guys we were talking about yesterday in the draft a little, or when we were going through the edge guys, where it was like the hype, right? Top recruit, went to Ohio State. They were very good. He was good, but got a little overhyped. Right. That, that's how I kind of looked at it. Anybody could tell you, Mike, I was A.J. Terrell was one of my favorite corners in that draft. You know, I actually had Jeff Okuda as number three. But Okuda, yeah, he's a good football player. It hasn't worked out. It hasn't. And then we, we see that happen from time to time. Right, Mike, with these, you know, top round picks. Now, whether he turns it around, I don't know. Right. Uh, you know, and, and can play to a level of the expectations of the top five pick. I don't think that's going to happen. You know, and, and then that's where sometimes the draft and all that hype puts this unfair expectation on a kid where you go, well, no, we he was misevaluated. He's not as good as everybody keeps telling him he is. Um, but he is starting caliber corner in the NFL with a lot of traits and things you like to go, wait, this guy can hang around and be, you know, a contributor or starter for our football team for a long time. And I think in the perfect world, Mike, right? Like we saw an instance like this, Evan Ingram, right? Last year, he's at the Giants. We've talked about him a few times where it just, it kind of got negativity rolling downhill and it kept get, gaining steam. And that's kind of what happened to Jeff Okuda. And I felt like, you know, hey, this is a good move for the Lions. I do think for the Falcons, too. It gives him a fresh start, and maybe he can rejuvenate his career, you know, under a new coaching staff and some people who can give him some new messages and new life. And nobody really knows what makes a player a bust. It's not just the player. No, I think over the no. years, the player gets blamed. It's the fit. It's the city. It's a young guy being thrust exactly. into a new location, a new everything. And – we talked about some of this yesterday. The idea that if you're taken sufficiently high in the draft, you feel like you've won and the game is over and you can just exist. Hey, I'm a I'm a top three draft pick. I'm exactly, pretty damn yeah. good. I sure. don't have to listen. I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything. I've arrived. And then all of a sudden, reality smacks you in the face and you get into a tailspin. And he had injury issues the first couple of yes, years. Last year was the first season. He was healthy wire to wire for the most part. But 15 games, 15 starts. And that tells you that the Lions thought something of him. They put him out on the field to start every game that he was healthy enough to play last year. 15 games, 15 starts. So there's something there, and sometimes that change of scenery is the thing exactly. that hits that reset button. Right. That you finally clear out this idea that I've got it made because I was a third overall pick. Yeah. And all these people fawning over me, all these people praising me, all these people telling me I'm great, and I lose sight of the fact that i got to put in even more work than whatever, whatever work I've put in before. I've got to put in even more to live up to the status that has now been given to me. The status comes with an expectation. And again, it's just one of many factors. Well, definitely. But he's good enough to play in the NFL. Yes, he is. Maybe he was misevaluated, or maybe he just didn't take it seriously enough. Yeah. Or maybe it was just a bad fit. Maybe it was just a but I mean, grand scheme of things, we're talking about three years. Yeah. Three years does not seem like much. 
But for an NFL player early in his career, three years can be everything. Yeah, it, it can. It, it sets the, you know, the mold and the perception gets set around you, right? And it, it becomes hard to kind of break some of those barriers down once they're, they're built up and people have said things about you and that's kind of how you're viewed. With Akuda. You know, and, and, and the that situation, Mike, you bring up good points. You, you know, we, we hit on this a little yesterday, right? Yeah, you're a top pick. You get, you know, the red carpet rose petals, and that sometimes can make guys go, hey, I'm the man, and, you know, there's nothing I can do wrong here. And this one, I get more of the inclination, this is a guy that it was like it's it's the opposite. It's the pressure. It's the, I got to try harder. I got to work harder. And he's so uptight playing and whatever else that things that he can do that are basic his whole life, like he can't do them because he's overthinking and he's overworking and he's over trying. I kind of get that sense. And, you know, I, I know some people that know the kid. He's from New Jersey. Uh, and, and I feel like that, that might be part of it too. It can kind of go either way. I'm not sure here, but I think that's, you know, where we're at. But regardless, yeah. You know, you, you said it right. He can play. He needs a new message. He needs a new vibe. He needs some people, needs the microscope, you know, off of him where, oh, you know, every time he let up a pass up in Detroit, it was, oh, we drafted. What a bust he is at number three. It's just hard to live like that as a young adult, like you're explaining with all the other factors that go into it. And then you're getting that on top of it. It's hard to fight through that. And hopefully now it can be a jump off point for some new confidence and new life for him. And that's a good point, and I'm glad you raised it. There can be circumstances where a guy puts too much pressure on himself Definitely. because of this status that has been thrust upon him. How do I live up to it? And right. every mistake I make is going to be magnified. I'm not just some rookie who's wet behind the ears. I'm a guy where there is intense pressure on me to live up to this notion that I'm a top five pick, that I'm the third guy taken, helping to turn around this Lions team that – washed out Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia after 2020, and then in comes a new regime. And where do we go? What do we do? How do we figure this out? And everything is new, and you're still early in your career, and you put even more pressure on yourself. And I think when you're injured, too, there's an even greater sense of pressure, not just to get healthy, but yeah. when you are healthy, to all of a sudden turn it around. And Agreed. Look, this I remember back in 2006 when Reggie Bush – was the presumptive number one overall pick of the Houston Texans, and then he wasn't. And it sounds ridiculous in hindsight to believe that any of it was influenced by the fact that his family was getting benefits from an agency that wanted to represent him, and it all blew up with the NCAA. And God, how hypocritical it looks in hindsight. That the NCAA is chasing guys. Did they around give him back his Heisman? Getting <laughs> no, no, but they, they no, should. but they should. You're right. They should. But right. anyway. Anyway, that all came up a week or two before the draft, and the Texans ended up taking Mario Williams. And, again, how do you justify being taken high in the draft when you play a position that doesn't allow you to create the kind of statistics that makes it easier to justify why you've been taken that high? And for a pass rusher, you better go out and have two or three sacks a game. And for a corner, you better have – one interception every other game. You better finish with seven, eight, nine, ten interceptions to justify because we need something tangible that we can point to and say this is why he was taken that high. Other yeah. than Deion Sanders, it's kind of hard to justify being taken that high at corner because there's nothing anyone can point to unless you're taking away half the field. Yeah. As right. as a shutdown corner, yeah. there's nothing tangible you can point to to say, oh, that's why we took that guy. You otherwise just fall into the vat with everyone else, and it's impossible to stand out in a way that justifies why you were taking that high. No, exactly right. And sometimes you become that shutdown corner, and then it gets used against you, right? Like Darrell Rivas, he's a shut, and people go, well, look, he doesn't have that many interceptions. He didn't have that many pass breakups. And it's like, yeah, no crap, because nobody wanted to throw near him. So it was the greatness of him that had the no stats and all that. But, yeah, it's a tough position. And, Mike, we kind of talked about this. I feel like maybe it was last week or actually maybe it was when I was uh, – but, but like, to your point with corners, and I maybe I was talking about this on my podcast, it's got to be maybe – you got to be one of the most mentally strong positions in, in sports or football because of the things you're talking about. Oh, I got to cover one of the greatest athletes in the world. And if he gets a catch, I'm looked at like, damn, you didn't do a good job. How dare you didn't cover Jamar Chase, who runs 4 3 and has a 40 inch vertical and could go wherever he wants? And you follow it, it's brutal. 
It is. And he's, uh, yeah, he's learning the hard way. But hopefully this will be the thing for Jeff Okuda to turn it all around and get him back on track. And, you know, with that, Mike, too, I throw out there and just go, like, great Scots, the Atlanta Falcons, and what they've done to revamp their defense and their team a little bit. And on that side of the ball, it's uh, it's pretty damn impressive. What are you shaking your head at? What are you looking at? Did I say something stupid? <laughs> Great Scots, great, great Scots, yeah. not great Scott, but yeah. great Scots. There are yeah. plenty of Scots out there, and they're all great. <laughs> the the uh, idea that you mentioned is something you said on this program, and I remember watching football as a youth, and the first time I heard that phrase, you got to have a short memory to play right. corner in the NFL, right. but you got to forget if you just got burned. Because if you're obsessed with what happened on the last play, the next thing you know, that guy's going to be you running by you. Again. You're going to be Tyree Kill right. biting for that that double move in exaggerated fashion so the kid could break free for the long touchdown. You just can't get it done if you're focused on the mistake you made or you didn't even make a mistake. You did everything you could yeah. right, but the ball was placed Perfect in the spot ball, where the great receiver player. Was five inches yeah. taller than right. you reached up and grabbed. Right, it. Justin Jefferson reached like this with one hand and caught it, you know, seven feet from his body. And you go, damn, I actually was in great position there. It is. It's brutal that way. It is. But Atlanta – with this new crew and their new defensive coordinator coming from you know the New Orleans Saints, and New Orleans is a team that we know over the last few years, Marshawn Lattimore and company, they're an aggressive defense. They play, they like their corners to be in your face and play man to man, and they got two guys that could possibly do that. And then you couple that with uh, Jesse Bates, right at at safety. You start to go, wow, that's secondary there. And then, you know, they did some good things on their defensive front, too, with Cade Nellis and on Yamada, right, re-signing Lorenzo Carter. And then they're sitting here in the draft in a spot where, you know, if they don't take quarterback, they could probably add another marquee defensive player to the unit here. So they've done a great job here. And this is a, a good trade because you might hit, you know, the jackpot with this guy. Like you're talking about, like the Jags, like the Jaguars did – with Evan Ingram, same kind of thing, where all of a sudden it's like, damn, see, he's in a better place. He's good. We changed the vibe for him. And look, he looks like he's one of the best tight ends in football. I think they're hoping that can happen here with uh, Jeff Okuda, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for him. That's what I'll say. Yeah, A.J. Terrell's the guy there. It's not like there's going to be any pressure on Jeff Okuda. you got some of these other names that have been brought in. Calais the Campbell. expectations on the team yeah. are fairly reduced, and and you can just go thrive. And it's contract year if they don't pick up the fifth-year option, when they don't pick up the fifth-year option. So all the more reason for Okuda to get it figured out, and then next year he could hit the open market and go make some money. And the Falcons, depending upon what they do with their free agency signings and departures next year, they get a little extra compensatory draft pick for that fifth rounder they gave up but that fifth rounder is nothing and that just tells me there was no market for the guy if the Falcons only gave up a five yeah for Jeff Okuda there was no one else out there's offering a four or anything more than that for the guy who was the third overall pick so the Falcons just quietly putting something together right? in a Aren't division they? that is wide open yeah. right now and who knows who's going to emerge the Panthers you could make an argument that they could win the division you could make an argument for the Bucks, the Saints and Maybe the Falcons are the ones who have been seven and ten each of the last two years. Right. Kind of a surprising seven and ten that doesn't feel like seven and ten. It feels like they're worse than they've been. And they've been through a lot with the cap consequences of the Julio Jones trade and then the Matt Ryan trade. And they had to rip off the band-aid and deal with that. And now they're getting to a point where the clouds are parting a little bit. And yeah, hey, if they don't go quarterback with eight overall in the draft. Right. Well, it's kind of like being third or fourth if three or four quarterbacks go ahead of you from the standpoint of what you need and what you're looking for. Go ahead. We don't want a quarterback. We're going to take our chance with Desmond Ritter for a year, draft all the quarterbacks you want ahead of us. We're going we're gonna to wait to have a potentially great position player, maybe a great defensive player, whoever. Whoever the best available player is or the player who is best on our draft board because we don't have quarterbacks on it, we're going to get a guy who's in our top – Three or four, maybe. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. I mean, you you, you got a chance to, right, get a really a, one of the marquee front seven players in the draft. You know, I think this takes them out of the market for a corner, right? I don't know if they would think about offensive linemen right there, but I would think that defense is going to be a thing. There's no receiver I that's worthy of the eighth pick. So I, I would think that, yes, when all said and done, 
that it's going to be kind of a leftover of the top defensive players in the draft that are not corners that are going to be involved in that conversation there for at eight for Atlanta. So be interesting. But, you know, like you said, they're going to be able to get a marquee player because, you know, by all due accounts, we're going to see three or four quarterbacks go off the board in those first four picks. Just the fact that I'm sitting here straining to remember the last time they had a great edge rusher tells me they should just focus on getting a great edge rusher. Yeah. What's the last great edge rusher? John Abraham. Who was it? That was who I think of. uh, John Abraham. um, uh, Also, um, yeah, he was the last great one they had. You're right. It hasn't had a lot. Patrick Kearney was down there. He was a good football player for a while, right? But they haven't had that guy since John Abraham came over from the New York Jets and – you know, made some money, but you're right. It's been a long time. We'll see if they can get that going. It's, it's, you can see they're trying to replicate, you know, things we've saw in that new Orleans defense the last few years. We'll see if they can do that. They got a little work to go still. The grits blitz once upon a time was what they called the Falcons defense. I think that was like late seventies. They made it to the playoffs. The first year of the fifth playoff team, it used to be four, from each conference. Yeah. And I think it was late seventies. I think they played the Eagles in a wild card game Four played five. That was the first year in my lifetime of paying attention to football that the Falcons were ever worth a crap. And I think it was the first time they were ever worth a crap. Cause they were one of those teams that came along, I think late sixties and just were never any good. And finally with the grit splits and company, they had a couple of good running backs, William Andrews, does that yeah. ring a bell? Yeah, I think William Andrews. Yeah, uh, and they and and they they had they had some they just had random scattered great players, but never great enough to to be a consistent winner. But somewhere along the line, when Steve Bartkowski, yeah, Steve Bartkowski, was the right, that area, yeah, sure. St- I thought of Steve Bartkowski the other day because when he was the first overall pick in the 1975 draft, that was the first time the light bulb ever went off for me that there's something special about being taken high in the draft honor and a privilege Mike. taken it's a big deal it's an honor and a privilege to be told hey steve there's plenty of great teams out there right now that maybe could use a quarterback that they could develop over the next few years you're going to the worst one but you're going to atlanta (laughs) the place that that has never had a good team enjoy your career it is an honor and a privilege. It's Vic been an Beasley. Honor a Vic privilege Beasley was White. another pass rusher they had that was good. Yeah, he, go. he did lead the NFL in sacks uh, in that 2016 year. So uh, uh, give him a little love. There you go. All right, uh, Vic Beasley, a, a first round draft pick of the Falcons, who ultimately a mixed bag. Yeah, right? and definitely remember, who's mixed. Who's the guy they drafted? The, the uh, who's the guy they drafted? Who's oh Tack McKinley? Yeah, that's the last time You're they right. went all in with a potential pass rusher, right. and he didn't work out. Although he's still he's still somewhere. He's somewhere. I think he's with the Cowboys right now, but I could be wrong yeah. because I usually am. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.